won't work quite the way you intended. So you have a contingency plan always, and you've got enough toys around there that you can play if something doesn't work. If that breaks down, you can go and do that. And and that's so you've got to pe keep people informed all the time. It's not just like oh, I got an idea, and we do it because it usually involves too many other departments, and it just doesn't happen that way. If it's a line of dialogue, that's easy. If it's a, it's a move that somebody wants to make, that's easy. But if suddenly you say, oh, I'd like to have you know, uh, um, you know. Uh, I don't know, a small biplane here because I got this funny idea. It doesn't happen. <laughs> and and we try I I try to keep things it's 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 a it's a balance. You try to keep things under control and you're hoping desperately that it'll all go wrong because when it goes wrong, interesting things start happening. And but you've got to be prepared for that moment. You've got to have a really strong foundation before you can let fly. And we were talking about before we came in here about the idea about improvisation and uh, and being creative and making great creative leaps. And the more technical skills you have, the easier that is. You've got to build a really strong foundation of knowledge and technical skills before you leap. But uh, if you've built this great tower, and the taller the tower is, and that's built on really solid stuff, the higher the leap is, and obviously more interesting, because <laughs> you've got a, a lot longer before you splat. <laughs> I think the, the trick is to have the highest leap possible because eventually you're going to hit the ground and it's going to, go, it's going to be awful. But in that period between leaping and hitting the ground, amazing things happen. <laughs> so build a tall tower. That's what school's all about. It's, it's, uh, uh, I can't deny it. I used, to, I used to be much more liberal in what I thought schools should be. And in the end, I really felt the more skills, really solid skills you can learn, the better it is because then you can, you can do these more extraordinary things based on that. If you don't have the skills, you just sort of flounder around in the mud the whole time. Um, no, I've, I've been asked a lot of times, but I keep avoiding it. I, I tend to try to concentrate on one thing at a time. At the moment, I'm just trying to concentrate on films. And I know if I run off and do a pop video, I might start enjoying it too much and not make films because it's a lot easier than making films. Uh, so I tend to, and I was supposed to do one for Kate Bush a week ago and, uh, and I didn't because I, I tend to, <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> uh, nothing wrong with Kate. <laughs> uh, but I, I just tend to focus on one thing at a time and like, and I'll work on that until either it falls or, do, or doesn't, and I avoid these little distractions. The problem with pop videos, it's really hard, because there's a, I think what's, there's an interesting world that's developing, and it's a gap. There's a gap between what you see in the cinema or on television and what you can see on pop videos. Pop videos, because they're, they're done cheaply and quickly, and not, not, not all of them are cheap, but, and they're also done basically for video, not for film, the, the, visually, the stuff is extraordinary. I think people are playing around in pop videos much more than in any other form at the moment. And that's really exciting. And I don't think films, in many ways, have caught up to pop videos as far as the, the visual side of things. What's your favorite step and why? <laughs> what and why? Uh, it's, actually, this is an easy one because it's, uh, it's the sketch where... Uh, um, I think it's Graham. No, it's John that comes in to the Undertakers with a bag, dragging this big sack behind him, and his dead mother is in the sack. And he's trying to find out what to do with her. And we go through a series of options. <laughs> you don't want to bury her, you know, you can cremate her. And eventually it comes down to suggesting that uh, they eat her. Uh, and then John discovers, in fact, he is a bit peckish, but no, he couldn't possibly. And the end, the, it's it's agreed that okay, we'll cook her, we'll eat her. If you don't like it, we'll dig a hole you can throw up in it. And it's <laughs> now that that was the most offensive sketch I'd ever heard when it was read. It was, I remember it was read out in Terry Gar Jones's garden one afternoon, and John and Graham had written this thing, and they read this out, and I just started dying of apoplexy. It was so funny. It was so outrageous. It was so unjustifiable. It was there was nothing you couldn't justify it on any level. It offended on every every basic level, and I thought that's why we have to do it. <laughs> and I'm still 
happiest with that one because there was always a side of Python that was out there to shock people, just to wake people up to say, uh-oh, because everybody's sitting at home slowly being transfixed by the box and dozing off and their brain is, even when they're watching, their brain is dead. And we kept trying to do things that would shock people out of that torpor. Uh, there was one thing I always wanted to do, which we never did, was to start the show, or didn't matter, in a sketch, we would start turning the volume down on the, on, on the, on the sound system as we're doing it. So, and do this very slowly, it goes on. And people would be sitting at home and eventually they'd have to get up and start turning their volume up. And you, you have to time this one very carefully until you know they've got their volume at the maximum and then you come out with the loudest noise imaginable <laughs> and blow up every set in the nation. <laughs> uh, but they didn't let us, that was one they didn't let us do. <laughs> but that's, that was the kind of thing that, you know, at our best we were trying to do is to kind constantly shock people into thinking or waking up or do whatever. Uh, anyway. <laughs> With hindsight, is there anything else that's really tasteless? Um, unjustifiable, like Life of Brian received a lot of criticism, but I suppose it's blasphemy. No, I mean, Life of Brian, we actually went out of our way to not be blasphemous. I mean, because originally it was going to be called, <laughs> it was going to be called Jesus Christ, Lust for Glory. <laughs> was the original title of it. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> And it happened, in a, you know, it was at a bar in Amsterdam when we were promoting Holy Grail. And I remember Eric and I got well, well pissed. And, uh, and, it's, uh, and he came up with that title. And that just started the whole process. And uh, it started going on about, you know, Holy Ghost going around, you know, trying to tell Mary that it really was the Holy Ghost, you know. And yeah, it was all right, you know, because uh, God said they could sleep together. It was really okay. And uh, uh, he was the Holy Ghost, honest. And <laughs> it was clearly a man who was not a Holy Ghost in any way. <laughs> But it, and it, was, it, was, it started out being very, very blasphemous. And then we decided, no, that, was, that would confuse the issue. And that's why we made it the life of Brian, the guy born next door who just happened to live a parallel existence. And my mother, who's a, you know, a very devout church-going lady, she didn't see any blasphemy in it at all because she could clearly see the division between Brian and Jesus. Uh, it was very funny because I remember Malcolm Muggeridge and the, the Bishop of Southwark yeah, on television. Neither of them had seen the film, and yet they were pontificating about how blasphemous and how disgusting it was. I mean, which I find extraordinary. I mean, and the bishop was wearing his nice purple with his great big silver crucifix, which he's very proud of that crucifix. He, it was like I was watching two guys that were even more in show business than we were, and, uh, and pontificating on something they hadn't bothered to see. If they had bothered to see it and then felt it was blasphemous, that's one thing, but they hadn't. And, uh, and actually, it was interesting. We finally got released in Italy last year. Actually, it was this year. The beginning of this year was finally released in Italy because for a long time it had been banned there. I don't think it, it's never been shown in Ireland. And the and ITV, uh, the the what independent broadcast IBA, still considers it. Um, it's one of the films that are censored that won't be shown on television here. And it's, I think, I mean, because we set out very clearly to not go after Jesus and his teachings, but to go after all the all the people that surround that, all the organized religions that develop out of that, all the, the nonsense that comes from uh, that kind of, zealot, the kind of zealotry and mindless belief, not, not about what was actually said by the man. That's the only thing you get these uh, cheap like heads of people condemning the film they've never seen. The cheap message was think for yourself. Yeah, that's right. We're all individuals. I'm not. <laughs> this is one of, the, one of the nicest scenes. The whole crowd of people saying we're all individuals. <laughs> What were your memories of directing um, the Holy Grail? Was that the best thing you co-directed? Holy Grail was madness because we, Terry Jones and I, were so desperate to become film directors. We again, we never directed a film. We'd worked on, the, we'd done a lot of the the, the the film sections of of the TV show. We were desperate to become directors, and when we were in a situation, we had the money to make the film with no strings attached. So we said, "We'll direct it," and then everybody named Terry gets to direct the film. And luckily there were two of us, and uh, so we became the film directors. And we made the film in five weeks for, I think, 460,000 pounds, which, looking back at it, I couldn't make that film now. I don't know how we did it. It was like it was done by different people, because we were, the advantage of being young and naive is, is, is uh, it it's puts you streets ahead of the people who've made a few films and know what's possible and what's impossible. And we didn't know what was possible. And we just rushed out there 
madly flailing about Scotland and making this thing. We got into this bizarre situation where about a week before we started shooting, we had chosen several castles around Scotland 